I'm here with Dr. Amano to do an organic chemistry exam from the ADA. Don't waste your money on any videos. Dr. Amano is doing it all for free. Hi, I'm Dr. Romano, a professor of organic chemistry here at Romano Scientific and the creator of Orgoman products and the author of the Dat Destroyer books. I'm going to go over with you today how to get what a 30 looks like. And I'm going to do an ADA exam that was released by the ADA and I'm going to solve it for you and show you how to go about doing it. Take this with a grain of salt though. The actual exam, I think, has got a lot harder. But these questions, I think, are very, very easy. So once you do this, maybe it'll build up a little confidence. Then get back to the Death Destroyer book, which is a lot more challenging. The thing I don't like about this exam, well, there's a lot of things I don't like about the exam. One, I think it's very easy, and the ADA released an exam that was really, really easy, and it's kind of misleading. The second thing, I don't really see any big things like... Um, RF factors when you do chromatography. I don't see any lab questions. I don't see Clayson's, Diekman's I don't see. I don't see Diels Alda. I don't really see enough of that to really put that much credibility that this is going to be overly helpful. But I think it'll be helpful to give you some confidence, but you got to go back. You got to go back to the Destroyer. Our new edition has all the new questions. For instance, questions on the Heck reaction. Questions on Suzuki, questions on Robinson. These are questions that could very well land, and I think you should know it. So I'm going to go through it, and I'm going to show you how I literally ripped the ass off of this test. Come on in and watch. Watch the symphony. Okay, the first question was number 71. It says here a characteristic feature of the SN2 reaction mechanism is... First of all, before we do anything, I wrote you a little note that the rate of an SN2 reaction depends on two things, the halide and the nucleophile. So if you were to say triple this and double this, the rate would go up by six. And if you remembered, whenever we do an SN2, the nucleophile attacks from the back side. And as you can see, the leaving group is here, the nucleophile is here, and right here would be the antibonding orbital. So we are putting electrons in that antibonding orbital, and that is ejecting the leaving group. So as you can see, choice A, it says it follows first order kinetics. No, this is second order kinetics. That's wrong. Let's skip B for a minute. It says there is no rate determining step. That's silly, it's one step. So if it's one step, as you can see, that single step has got to be the rate determining step. That's kind of silly. Then it says steric factors have little influence. Oh, bullshit. Steric factors have little influence. If you were going to attack something from the back side, you better have little guys. You have big guys, you're not going to be able to get through to attack the antibonding orbital. So that's silly. Collision of three or more particles is required. There's only two particles required. And choice B, which is the correct answer, it produces a stereochemical inversion of configuration. That is true. Anytime you do an SN2 reaction and you start with an R and there's a chiral carbon that you're attacking, that chiral carbon is inverted to become S or vice versa. Let's go to 72. Which bromide here is most readily undergoing the SN2 reaction? Well, as I just said, think small. So what you're going to do is look for a methyl halide. A methyl halide is something that looks like this. Means that there's only hydrogens. Well, I don't see that here. However, this is a primary. Notice A is a tertiary. B is a secondary. C is a secondary. E, don't even dream about. How the hell are you going to do an SN2 reaction on this? If you attack this from the back side, you're going to literally have to shear through the ring like an airplane going through a building. There's no way you can do a backside attack. So choice D is a primary halide, and it's got to be the answer. 73. Ethane reacts with chlorine in the presence of heat or ultraviolet light to give this reaction, which is an intermediate. I'm going to show you a real easy way to do it. Whenever you see heat or light, I want you to think radical. A radical, therefore, you could eliminate B, which is a anion. C 
is a carbocation, and E is another cation. So that's wrong. Now, you either have radical A or radical D. I want you to never forget something. If you ever see H dot, I want you to run for the hills. It's very unstable. It's very unlikely for you to come across this in organic chemistry. Very high energy. So by default, without having to do any mechanism, choose the radical that's got the electron on the carbon atom. And we keep that simple. Let's go to 74. How does the energy content of the transition state of a chemical reaction compare with that of the reactants and the products? Well, all you got to do is go back to this little picture that I drew, and you can see the transition state is the highest energy point. Um, you can't isolate the transition state. This is where chemical bonds are made and broken simultaneously. So notice it is greater than both reactant and product. What a joke that was. The next question, which is the intermediate in this reaction? All right, let me get this off here, and we'll just do this. We're going to do one little tiny step. First of all, whenever I see HCl is being added to an alkene, this is a Markovnikov addition. So it's going to be a carbocation intermediate. That eliminates C, D, and E. So as you can see, if you took CH3, CH double bond, CH, CH3 with HCl, you can't miss even if you wanted to. You can add the H to either side because this is symmetrical. And let's add it to this side. Notice this is the slow step because it's the forming of the carbocation. And then all we do is go hunting and that would be choice A. Very easy, piece of cake, this is a joke. All right, let's take this away. Let's get another one up. All right, next, 76. The reaction of benzoic acid with nitric acid and sulfuric acid gives blank. First thing is the COOH group is a meta director. If it's a meta director, it's going to add something meta. Well, HNO3 and H2SO4 is going to put on a nitro group, an NO2 group to the meta position, and all meta directors slow me down. So choice A, I don't even have to go much further, is that this product is the result and would be slower than if it was the nitration of benzene. Why? Because this group is meta director, meta slows me down. We have a lot of questions on this in the Dot Destroyer book. Um, much more difficult than this. But this is a nice question. I kind of like that. 77, they gave you an IR and they said the signal is between 1750 and 7, 1700. What would this indicate? Guaranteed problem. If you see an NH2 group um, in the IR, if you looked over here, the NH2 group would come in as two spikes, around 3,300. And if it was an NH spike, you would get a spike like this. Now, why two spikes? Because you can stretch the molecule symmetrically or anti-symmetrically. So there's two ways it can stretch. Think about if you stretch your arms, you can put them in the same direction or the arms going in opposite. And it would be a single spike like this for an NH around 3300. This is a sure bet, a carbonyl comes in around 1720. And OH is right where an amine is, but usually if you looked over to here, an OH group, for your purposes, it'll almost look, it will always look very broad because of the intensive amount of hydrogen bonding. That would be up around 3,300. A double bond is 1,650, and a triple bond between the carbons coming around 2,200. Correct answer is B. It's a short bet question. 78. If partition between equal volumes of ether and water, which will show the greatest preference for water, the minute you hear water, I want you to think O's or N's. If you see something with more O's and more N's means more water soluble. And as you can see, choice E has the most amount of O's. My God, look at all those O's. Those O's means there's extensive amount of hydrogen bonding. That was a joke. 79, which is a resonance form of this? Well, if you go off to the side, in resonance, all we're going to be doing is moving the electrons. Okay, I'm not going to put that little hydrogen in for clarity. 
And as you can see, watch the movement, two movements. One steps in and one steps out. And that would give me this. And that would be choice B. Very easy. Now, when you get to the destroyer book, you'll see much more challenging questions than that. All right, let's do another one. Okay, here we go. We're on 80. Which structure is chiral? A chiral carbon in this parlance um, means we're always going to assume um, a carbon is chiral. Notice in B, there's four different groups. As you can see, the carbon in the middle has an H, a methyl, carboxy, and an NH2 group. None of the other ones have four groups that are different. For example, D, there's two H's. So that would be a chiral carbon. This next one is a good question. It's a slam dunk. Here we, we want to know the relationship. Here the two methyls are trans. Here the two methyls are cis. So if I ever ask you, what's the relationship between cis-trans, what are they called, diastereomers? That's sure a bad question. The next one, we want to know which conformation is most stable of 1,4-dibromocyclohexane. If I tilt it a little tiny bit, this is horribly drawn by imbeciles who wrote this up, but as you can see, this bromine is equatorial and this is equatorial. Even though this is not a good drawing, I understand what they mean. You want to go for the most groups in the equatorial position. I got much more challenging question than this um, than this in the destroyer, but that makes this question an absolute freaking joke. All right, next, I'm on 83. We are cooking here. Here's another example of incorrect terminology. It says, which one represents a trans-E isomer? First of all, you never use trans-E. I always tell my students, whenever you use trans, you have two groups that are different. For example, if I gave you this, this would be an example of something that's trans because this and this groups are different. But if I said to you something like this, something like this, I would not use um, cis or trans. I would use the E and the Z. A nice little trick I like to teach my kids is you look at the left side and you say these two guys have a fist fight. This guy has got the greater priority. And then these two guys have a fist fight. This has the greater priority. So therefore, they're on the same side. So I would call this a Z. All right. But at any rate, let's go to this. You don't use EZ on rings or benzenes. So that eliminates A and B. If you rotated this a little bit, you can see that these two methyls are going on the same side. So that would make this a cis. So that's wrong. Um, if we go to this one, and again, if you look at this carbon, it's got the same groups on it. So that's out. Now, if you go to this one, I'm going to rotate the molecule just like this so you can see it. H and an F have a fist fight. Who wins the fist fight? The greatest priority is an F. Bromine and an H have a fist fight. Bromine wins. They're across from each other, so it would be E. You want to call it trans, but I know what they meant, so it's good enough. Now, the next question on 84, this is a very easy question. They want to know what's the name of this. So all you do is you start on the left side, and you pick the longest chain that's got the double bond. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it would be 4-methyl-1-hexene. That's a real easy question. If you look at number 85, the reduction of a ketone, so all you would do is if you go off to the side and I gave you a ketone and you reduced it, either with say lithium aluminum hydride or NABH4, you break the double bond, put an H on it, put H's all over the place and that will give you the secondary alcohol. And then finally, what is the major product of this reaction? If you have two substituents sitting on a benzene ring, the more activating group will do the directing. So what we're going to do here is the, a nice rule of thumb. If you have two substituents, one's activating and one's deactivating, you're going to take the activating group, which here is the methyl, and go 
para to it. So if you go para to it, you would get this. Now, why do I love this so much? In advanced organic chemistry, we call this double reinforcement. It's like saying you have two friends. What's the ideal situation is to make both friends happy. So as you can see, I am meta to the meta director and I'm para to the OP director. And choice B would be the correct answer. Okay, I'm gonna wrap this video up. I'm gonna do the other group of questions in the next video, which will accompany this one. So I'll say goodbye to you. Hopefully you're enjoying this. This is a piece of cake so far, but get back to studying after you see me finish all these um, and hit the destroyer questions. All right, bye-bye.